I was hoping you could talk to us about what the Health Administration Research Consortium at the Business School of the University of Colorado Denver is. I am Rulin Stacy. I'm the Director of Graduate Programs in Health Administration at the University of Colorado Denver. That includes our executive program and our residential campus program, which are both CAMI accredited and MBA program. The University of Colorado Denver has created the Health Administration Research Consortium. Dr. Kuntia is the director of that consortium. The theory behind that is that my background is I've been the CEO of several different academic health systems. I've got connections throughout the industry and practice, but we wanted to find a way to unique combine that with academics. And Dr. Kuntia, Dr. Ning, others are instrumental in bringing both of those together with the practice background, the research background, and that's what the Health Administration Research Consortium does, I think, better than any a similar organization in the industry. Jivan Kuntia, I'm an associate professor at University of Colorado Business School, Mission Systems and Health Administration Program. I'm a faculty in both. I do direct Health Administration Research Consortium. My research is around the transformation of health systems, and I have been involved in multiple areas around those. The genesis around this started when we were stuck with COVID, and we, we started monitoring health systems, how they they're responding. So between those optimism and pessimism, we thought we need to bring the best cases and practices to everybody else. So that was basically the founding stone. So throughout 2020 onwards until now, we have been investigating different aspects of these health systems. Broadly, we say in four areas relevant to business, what they are doing, digital and intelligent health aspects, the leadership, as well as responses to different other things such as equity, diversity, workforce issues, and so on and so forth. I think the HARC since its creation has created some good impact in terms of documenting some best practices, disseminating through industry, and JMR has been a good partner in that process. We have we have a lot of activities going over there. Uh, Business.ucdenver.edu slash HARC is the site where one can find a lot more details. I want to move into you just telling us a little bit about yourselves, your role in this research, and why this research is important to you. My PhD happens to be from the University of Colorado, Denver, but in between the time when I got my PhD and now, I've been the CEO of several health systems, um, Poudre Valley Health System, University of Colorado Health, uh, Fairview Health System. I am now back in academics with University of Colorado Denver and also work as a partner with Guidehouse Consulting to make sure that I'm staying relevant in the industry. So I am a former chair of the American College of Healthcare Executives. I'm calling you, talking to you today from Chicago, where we're about to have our annual meeting of the American College of Healthcare Executives. And my role in this research is to provide the, the industry perspective it, with the academic flavor that comes from the two primary authors who will we can hear from now. As I told, since 2020, when we started, we collaborated with Guidehouse and started monitoring all these health systems. There has been continuous dialogues with health system CEOs, practitioners, consultants, and of course, we were scanning all the news reports that were coming in our way. And suddenly, at the end of 2020-21, we saw a lot of health systems struggling financially, and mergers and acquisitions increased drastically. So that rang a bell. We need to look at it. Obviously, somebody would say this merger and acquisition trends is getting fueled by the post-pandemic situation of, you know, of financial distress, capital availability. We didn't see any regulatory pressure over there, but maybe there is something happening over there. The market power of some others where others are becoming quite insolvent and the future looked so uncertain. Somewhere there within the press reports, I came across seeing that look Financial insolvency and digital disruption are two major factors for merger and acquisition. That, 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 that struck me a little bit of curiosity in my mind. Is that so? And that's where, when I looked at the whole concept of merger and acquisition, it's actually the other name for it is integration. Now, if we call each and every integration as merger and acquisition, I think we are doing an injustice. So if I do not have a call center and I am acquiring a call center, which is supposed to be a big gorilla, as you say, is that a really merger and acquisition? So I thought, okay, this needs to be unraveled in a much more grand way. So we latched into this concept of integration with this uh, first thing, 
and asked our the question as the question how is integration happening in post pandemic era of course merger and acquisition was the was the motivation or the press reports that we we saw somewhere expecting 10 to 15 20 billion dollars going to happen in the next one or two years but our buzzword over here is why this integration is happening and and is it all merger and acquisition dr ning i'd love to hear from you Sure. So uh, first of all, I'm a research fellow from the Health Administration Research Consortium. Uh, I was highly involved in our uh, climate study for the health system. Uh, it's my great honor to have the survey with more than 100 CEOs of the health system. And this paper is the one part of our climate survey. Uh, regarding this paper, my main role, I mostly contributed to the methodology part and the overall paper development and the execution. The most interesting part I like from this paper is because I'm majoring in the information technology and business. So nowadays we are all talking about digital transformation. So integration can be one part of this uh, digital enabled transformation. So I was interested to see how the digital disruption, uh, they are moving or uh, enabling this uh, integration. But of course, there are some other factors like the external environmental and the customer service uh, needs. Uh, they are also uh, pushing this integration process. So yeah, that is uh, what my role and my uh, research focus in this paper. So Nancy and me sort of went forth and back. What exactly we mean by integration, why that is happening. So obviously the external competition is one thing, but Nancy's point was very well taken that emerging digital technology is pushing this. Our realization from the climate survey survey and the earlier digital orientation paper in the, in the JMIR clearly shows that not all health systems are ready when it comes to shift to the digital innovation, assimilation and transformation. So that's a shaky thing. Plus there are issues like interoperability happening, startups, all other healthcare health systems trying to take away the, the money. Integration driven, driven by emerging disruptive digital technologies is going to be a norm, not only between health systems, but also between health systems and non-health systems. So we saw, okay, market competition, financial part, and, and digital the things that we don't know, very uncertain. But also somewhere within, within these dynamics, there are some great health systems who are trying to do very well for the customers. They are so, so consumer-centric that the sentences in their mission, vision, all the way to the practice really translates that. And they have taken customer consumer service initiatives, including patient satisfaction, loyalty, reducing reimbursements, somehow serving the patients wherever they can, just in time, distributed care. All those are even sometimes sounds very new to me. I don't know. Certainly my provider is providing me a health monitoring app and telling that you do that uh, et cetera, et cetera. So some of those are eye-opening. So is it coming from healthcare, out of healthcare? That's another question that remains to be addressed. But the fact is somewhere if healthcare need to leapfrog either digitally or in customer service ways, integration is the norm. Integration has to happen. Let's, let's keep it out of the door that health systems can code and program everything and anything by themselves. So, but then the question comes, is that the panacea to all these things and where it is helping, where it is hurting? Tell us about what we know about health system consolidation now and what's different about it. Well, I'll tell you my thought from many in the industry. Georgetown is an example. Uh, um, we saw a similar situation with University of Arizona and Tucson joining Banner Health. There, we've also seen the reverse of that, where community systems will join in with larger systems. When I was at Fairview, we saw the community Fairview system really become part of the, the University of Minnesota. When I was at University of Colorado, the community system, Poudre Valley Health System, University of Colorado Hospital, came together to merge to create University of Colorado Health. So it's over the last two decades, we've seen all flavors of, of that happening. Uh, 
I think that that speaks uh, uniquely to those academic systems. What this paper shows is that the smaller systems are more are, are more apt now to join larger systems, and that's because of COVID. That's the pressure that's joining them, that's pushing on them right now. They have to do something. They know they have to do something. Academic systems are really not as apt to um, push toward mergers and acquisitions as we we found in this paper. What, what I think this shows is that academic health systems are less willing to listen to their patients and less willing to listen to the market because Georgetown's ego was, was bruised. That's what we're finding. We can now prove that some of those things are true. So how close did I come, Nancy and Javon? Yeah, I mean, to, to reward it, the value proposition of all types of health systems in United States healthcare is currently not the same. And, and some here it it, it wins very well, somewhere it hurts very bad. Uh, so that's exactly if it is academic, if it is just primary care units, uh, things are, are differing. And just to latch back a little bit, no, I mean, merger and acquisition is not new. It has been happening since 90s, as Joe is telling. But what happened in the last couple of years is probably United Health uh, is going to acquire a 13 billion dollar of change healthcare. Centen is buying, buying Megalon Health, uh, I think two or $3 billion. Cigna is uh, acquiring MD Life. These are health systems. On the other side, if you see organizations like Dispatch Health, Gig Capital, Op Health, Cloud Break, telemedicine providers, Teladoc, Livongo, InTouch, they are, coming, they are coming also merging in a significant way. At the same time, we are hearing like Detroit's Henry Ford and, and Michigan, they are sort of, they're not calling it a merger, but sort of integrating to be a bigger thing. Atrium and Wake Forest, they are, they are, they are becoming the next generation academic health system. So, uh, and of course, we are, we are looking at examples in Kentucky, us in Monroe, we have discussed some of these things. What basically says that, uh, again, going back, is not, not all these mergers and acquisitions has to be taken uh, in a in a one single sentence. So there are different factors. Motivation. So Javon, can I, if I summarize this too, that that to me is a, is a significant takeaway that even in 2022, uh, what we've showed in this research is that what is driving mergers and acquisitions is far more finance than concerns about customers. The pandemic has reoriented the value propositions of several health systems to be digital and consumer-centric. And this leapfrogging and transformation needs a very significant change in approach for the health systems. So that might drive a lot of integration as we go ahead. Let, let me give an example. Today, if any health system has to think of a pandemic unit, virology unit, it needs to have a solid integration plan with a pharma, RNA, DNA, genetics. Earlier, probably that was not heard of. Of course, no pharmacy in a health system cannot think of a drive-in now. They have to have a drive-in or walk-in. So think of the curbside delivery. So see, these kind of discussions have started. I would add to that too, that that COVID was a horrible thing, but absent COVID, our digital capabilities in healthcare would have been removed a decade. It would have taken us at least a decade longer to get to where we are today. And if, if we're looking for some positive of COVID, that's what we've seen. And it's meaningful. Our uh, research background, uh, our hypothesis was like, uh, uh, obviously, as Julian mentioned, the finance, the external environmental concern was the main and it was funded uh, in our paper. It is the main reason that uh, uh, pushed uh, the integration. Uh, we also studied the technology driven and the customer service needed driven uh, integration, but uh, it shows out still, even with COVID, the financial concerns or in other words, we call it external environmental uh, computation perception, it is a top one reason. It is still the top one reason uh, for the integration plan. Uh, so for our next uh, steps in our research, we would like to study more um, because uh, the external environmental concern, it can uh, include many uh, factors, not only about COVID, not only about this uh, change, but some other uh, uh, confounding uh, factors. So we want to 
uh, go deeper to study how the technology disruption, te disruptive technologies and customer service need. Let me add to that a little bit. So the study was more or less exploratory, 100 uh, plus uh, and perceptual data and stuff like that. So when I'm telling these things, we have to take a little bit of within the rigor and relevance touch. Things are relevant that we can see this is what is happening. Within that, let me give three statements here. Market is driving both vertical and horizontal integration. So everything is happening. That is nothing new that was happening in health. Technology is driving more vertical integration than horizontal integration. So health systems are acquiring one small telehealth unit along with their call center or frontline. That's vertical integration than horizontal integration. Customer service orientation is driving more horizontal, but not vertical. So I'm driving another unit so that I can, I can have specialists or I can have and that unit probably is because big, small hospital, easier to acquire them. So the nature of integration is changing when we talk about technology and, and customer service. It's not the same now. So healthcare, health systems are not going gaga over saying that we'll acquire another hospital. I think they are thinking very carefully in the post pandemic, why we need to acquire and how it is adding value. Uh, then we are going deeper into size, burden, reason and other kind of things and, and looking at these more details. Uh, I'll take those at a pinch of salt. Maybe things will change from Boston to Florida as we go, to, go ahead and, and stuff like that. One of the implications that I want to draw here when all this vertical horizontal technology and service put this to cross through in a very futuristic view. What should we be worried about? What should we be thinking about now, given the situation emerging? Uh, I don't know the answers, but some thoughts that comes to our mind. Monopoly is one thing. Let's keep that at, at the bay. But monopoly by non-health systems, is that good? Should there be any sort of uh, directed, orchestrated, stipulated, managed merger and acquisition regime that we should follow? Or do we want, or will there be a situation when after two years, suddenly we have all the healthcare completely taken over by retail and digital players uh, where the service part is well ignored, the cost, the cradle to grave, that is completely gone. So we don't know many of these things until unless a significant review and revise of guidelines, scrutiny that need to evolve. And I think that's a strong uh, recommendation from us. I, when I scanned all the policy guidelines, I didn't find anything on that aspect. Uh, so probably much of these are going pretty much unmonitored way, uh, maybe investor driven, Maybe QT driven. Javon talked earlier about the fact that this is data that was collected in in 2021. We've now collected data in 2022, and I, I think, and we'll do a similar study and 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 be able to do a, a very good before and after. But the going to what Jabon just said is that in what we saw since the last study is the most meaningful uh, increase in cost for employee participation in health systems in my life. Uh, just in the last six months, we've seen, particularly for nurses, but others, in order to get nurses to work in an environment where, and other employees, costs have had to go up dramatically. And that has set a new baseline. It's not going back down. There's, It's not reasonable to think that. So when we're thinking about what the future is, I think the data, which by the way, I, I should point out too, all of the data that we've collected is on the website. And, and you can look at all, we, we had a conscious decision discussion about that. Do we want to put the data, do we want to keep it internal or make it available to everybody? And we decided the latter. It's it's available to anybody who wants to look because we welcome the review and, and, and the insight. But I think that where we're going, is is going to be similar. Uh, it's going to, to follow that trend. That the costs are going up. What we identified in 2021 is going to be magnified in 2022. Mergers and acquisitions are not going away. We we, we must be prepared for the lessons we learned to be able to adapt in 2022. Yeah, let me step back here a little bit. Boston, New York, where competition is very high, uh, are one case scenario. Mm. Uh, rural areas are another case scenario where we don't have hospitals and healthcare systems uh, hundreds of miles. 
So you need telehealth to connect so that a small clinic can connect. Now, if I compare and contrast these two, in the second case, the service niche and the delivery model is good if the merger and if the integration is happening. Let's not use the word merger. Integration amongst these units is actually making a psychiatric available 2 a.m. in the night in the mountain region of Colorado. Great. I'm not kidding on this. The, the, the psychiatric is in, is in Denver and we could connect and immediately intervene. Is that a cost leadership approach? Is that a transaction efficiency approach? So now if we step back to the theory that has been proposed so far in management economics uh, in the literature. So the reasons are the mechanisms why these environments or this uh, broadly it comes from transaction cost theory. So there is hazard section, there is transaction efficiency cost reasons because of which people go for mergers. But the but the the way to go about it, these are reasons that's fine. But is it going to is it going to lead vertical or horizontal? That is in the hands of managers. So just because we need to be a better cost leader. Does it mean that we should be two health systems to merge and be a monopoly? That's not acceptable. What may be acceptable is we need to be better in cost and therefore by providing better service, we can have a cost leader. That's a different thing. So monopolistic behavior versus consumer centric behavior, monopolistic behavior versus collaboration delivery model, unified solution behavior are two different aspects. So what policymakers should check is, is it a monopolistic reason for which it is happening? What are those 30 reasons for which this merger is going to happen versus the service niche, unified solution, uh, one-stop shop, delivery, all those access I told about. If it is happening for the latter region, great, let it go, let, let it happen. If it is happening for the prior region, we need to put a stop there. So health systems are realizing we need to have others in our portfolio. Okay. So we can we can leave frog and leverage digital and we can we can give give better customer service that's actually very good news if you see it one sense we are not doing it only for monopolistic or or market driven reasons or this is this is information that the ftc could use as they evaluate anything any mergers they have to look at this kind of stuff and i would propose that perhaps this study is an opportunity for them to to use as a review on the whether or not a, a merger is or is not noble or if it will will or will not impact patient care if it will if the digital transformation involved in a merger will give more access or if it will just increase costs i would encourage anybody who who is interested in this to first of all go to the health administration research consortium website and look at these data themselves and see if if you see these data confirmed in in our research or if you look in a different way but we would welcome any collaboration we would welcome any alternative viewpoints we are an open book in the research consortium everything that we look at is available for public review i encourage everybody to do that and and uh, reach out to me or or Nancy or Jabon if you have any questions or ideas for collaboration. We are all about moving this forward. Yeah, I just want to say, please uh, check our website frequently. And as Rulan just said, we are doing our second uh, year survey. And we did find something changed compared to what we collected and analyzed from last year's survey. So we will find something new. Uh, at our next steps for this research and some other uh, relevant project. So please check our website often and uh, um, you will find new updates. This is a starting point, I would say. In my, in as far as I know, this is one of the comprehensive yet exploratory look into horizontal and vertical integration in healthcare, considering two other factors that we perhaps didn't knew yesterday this 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 can go there are a number of research questions that need to be addressed and explored with this background so the the next 10 miles view looks pretty much engaging if anyone wants to engage and collaborate uh, the number of ideas in our, our minds to talk about obviously we can flesh all those things out with future research 
and unraveling the situation in significant way. I must say that this study could not have been possible without Guidehouse Consulting. Uh, they have been significant partner to us. It would not have been possible to many CEOs giving us inputs and their, their remarks and, and discussions and so on and so forth. They have really thankful to them. Uh, University of Colorado Denver and University of uh, Wisconsin Parkside where Nancy obviously could allow us to do this kind of things venture into. We are very grateful to you. And most importantly, uh, Dr. Joe and Jay Meyer, we are very thankful to you to give us this platform and publish the study. You really organized a good review panel who could give us a good uh, inputs and, and shape the study and really make it polished. Thank you. And thank you for this interview. Certainly, if you know anything, if you want to know anything more about it, send us an email and we'll be glad to have a discussion.